Hello, this is Tim Congdon, Chair of the Institute of International Monetary Research at the University of Buckingham. Um, it's uh, September 2023, uh, and um, this is another one of my monthly uh, contributions to the debate on monetary policy. This time, I'm not going to be uh, looking at money trends in any particular country. I want instead to focus on a major analytical issue. This issue is how does QE or quantitative easing, how is it to be defined and how does it work? Obviously the last 15 years or so this phrase quantitative easing has been uh, in, the, in, the, in the debate on monetary policy thousands, tens of thousands of times. And I'm afraid that, despite all of that, that there's still a lot of confusion about it. Now, today I'm going to be comparing the views of Ben Bernanke, uh, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve between 2006 and 2014, his views and my views, the views of Tim Congdon. I'm going to be, obviously you can guess from what I'm saying, rather critical of Ben Bernanke, um, but let's try and I'll try and be fair and okay. Now, before we get into the guts of it, I want just to put this piece of evidence in front of you. This is the relationship in the last 40 years between the rates of growth of money and the rates of growth of normal GDP in the G20 countries. The relationship is very clear, clear cut. Don't be too technical, but the R squared here is, is 0.99, in fact, slightly a bit above 0.99. The t statistic on the regression coefficient is up to over 50. This is a clear-cut relationship. If you don't believe that the rate of growth of the quantity of money, broadly defined always in my work, the rate of growth of the quantity of money is relevant to the determination of national income, don't watch this video. I'm not interested in, in your views. You're not interested in mine. Forget about it. As far as I'm concerned, this is fundamental to economics. So if you want to stimulate an economy, we grow the quantity of money, all right? If you want to slow the economy down, we reduce the rate of growth of the quantity of money, okay. Now what I'm gonna do, um, first of all, is just to define QE uh, as it was defined in the British debate uh, at the time of the Great Depression, a Great Recession about getting on for 15 years ago now. Um, I was involved in that debate, um, and I just want to, I'm sorry, this presentation I'm going to be uh, looking at this, the, my notes quite a lot. QE involves the purchase of assets from non-banks by the state. It could be the government, in fact, I won't talk about that, that now today, although it's quite important, by the government or the central bank, purchase of assets from non-banks to increase their deposits, the quantity of money, in order to have that positive effect on normal GDP to boost the economy. All right. So the, in the British way of thinking about these things, um, this was very much working, the purchases were working through the quantity of money, reflecting, if you wish, that monetarist thought I gave at the very start. This was the uh, one of the people who pushed this through was Mervyn King, Lord King at the Bank of England. But it was very far from, he wasn't the only person involved. There was also people like Charlie Bean, economist at the Bank of England. There were articles in the Bank of England Quarterly Bulletin. It was understood that this is what QE meant. A book just published, uh, published last year by, uh, um, by Ben Bernanke. Got a nice snappy title, 21st Century Monetary Policy. And in this, he has quite a long discussion about QE. And really, the, 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 this video is about the differences between, if you wish, my view of QE, the British view as of in the Great Recession, <coughs> uh, compared with Ben Bernanke's view. Now, what he says there is that the, in the way he thinks about it, that QE is the purchase by the central bank of longer dated securities to reduce uh, the yields, longer dated yields 
He's really talking, in fact, about purchases of bonds, not of securities in general. And notice that this, I took this definition actually from his book, that he doesn't say from which type of agent the purchases are made, and he says nothing about the effect of these actions on the quantity of money. Okay, so it's a very different approach from that that we had in Britain uh, 10 or 15 years ago, which really kind of rolls on to today. May I just say before we get into the real differences, that it, to me, it's a little bit vague. You know, um, uh, Bernanke talks about improving financial conditions. Um, anyhow, before we move on into a bit more detail, notice also is crucial that the idea is that the purchases of bonds really, purchases pushes up their price and pushes the yield down. <clears throat> I'm going to criticize that when we get later on uh, in this presentation. Now just to get over the relationship between the central bank operations and the quantity of money, I'm now going to give seven slides, which the, the diagrams, what's being said is two plus two equals four, all right, it's just that these are just logically, uh, they, they, they can't be disputed, that they're two plus two equals four propositions. Let's start off with um, a picture. This is me, all right, this isn't Bernanke. Uh, this, the, the, the picture of the commercial banking system. The banks have got assets, they've got loans to the private sector, which is what they make their profits on. They've got some government securities, and they've got cash reserves, some of these uh, in their tills and vaults and so on, and then they've got the cash reserves at the central bank. Um, and then on the other side of the balance sheet, they've got some capital, it's the green little bit, and then they've got their deposits, that's the yellow bit. In this particular example, the, the um, balance sheet it's 100 units, the deposits are 90 units. And what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do in this exercise is to increase that yellow bit, all right? That's the purpose of the QE operations, as far as I'm concerned, as far as other people are concerned um, <clears throat> in the uh, episode back in 2008, 2009, when we had a bad recession in the UK. <clears throat> so the first step, is that the central bank goes to commercial banks and says, we want to borrow from you. Sounds a bit odd, but that's what they do. The central bank borrows from the commercial banks and it credits 10 units to the commercial bank's cash reserves. In this example, uh, the, ca the cash reserves were 15 at the start. They become 25. And then in exchange for that, the commercial banks add 10 units to a new deposit which belongs to the central bank. It's a bit odd that the central bank keeps a deposit at the commercial banks. Well, they don't. Because in the next step, the crucial step really, <clears throat> what happens is that the, um, the central bank uses uh, that um, deposit that it's got at the commercial banks um, to buy something, to buy, in the paradigm case, government securities from the non-bank private sector, which increases the non-bank private sector's deposits, that yellow bit, that is money. Can I just say that the central bank's own deposit is never included in the quantity of money because the central bank itself is a tiny organization in terms of employment, doesn't affect aggregate demand, that's not part of the quantity of money is usually defined. The yellow bit, the deposits held by the non-bank private sector, people, companies, financial institutions, that is money because that then affects aggregate demand, that affects asset prices, and so on. So <clears throat> what we've done um, is um, by this um, second step of the central bank buying securities from the non-bank private sector, We've increased the amount of money in the economy by 10 units. 
by 11% in this example. <clears throat> I showed you a relationship between money and nominal GDP. Yes, that raises equilibrium and nominal GDP by about 10, 11, 12%. You don't believe me, I don't mind. That is the way the world works. Okay. All sorts of ifs and buts, all sorts of problem, problems. That's the guts of the story. Okay. Now, I'm going to just repeat this. That what I've just gone through, well, that may surprise you a bit. It's, it sounds very simple. This is 2 plus 2 equals 4. There's nothing, it's all just straightforward. Um, you know, it's a bit of geometry, that's all. Nothing complicated, really. I've focused here on the commercial bank balance sheet. On the central bank balance sheet, they've got extra, the, that central bank balance sheet has grown as well. have got extra liabilities. The cash reserves owed to commercial banks have gone up from 15 units to 25. But the central bank has got 10 other units um, which is the securities is just bought. So the, the, the um, okay, that's what's happened. You may wonder that, that, that these operations are as powerful as this. Let's just be clear that um, they are not 21st century. They were conceived um, by uh, um, uh, John Maynard Keynes in the late 1920s, early 1930s, early 1930s in discussions with the effect of the Treasury's <coughs> UK Treasury's chief economic advisor, chap called Ralph Hawtrey. They wrote about these operations. They called them monetary policy outrance, means monetary policy to the uttermost. And by the way, in Britain, they were done. They were carried out in the early 1930s, and Britain had a much milder recession than the United States. If it surprises you that this, these operations are so powerful, let me just tell you, the state can cause hyperinflation, all right? If it can cause hyperinflation and it can cause price stability or falling prices, there must be something in between. And that's all that these operations are. Okay. The, um, now, <clears throat> let's get back to Ben Bernanke. Um, this is what he said, this is the definition of QE in his book, just to remind. And now this is what he says on page 283. And again, if you'll excuse me. Now he says, um, economists have extensively debated how QE works. And indeed, if it works at all. When the FOMC, that's the Federal Market Committee, the Federal Reserve, first began discussing securities purchases, some economists argued uh, that QE, which after all is simply a swap of one asset, of, uh, one set of financial assets, bank reserves, cash bank reserves, for another longer term securities, that this swap should have little or no effect on asset prices or the economy. I've just argued <laughs> that um, the state, the central bank, can cause hyperinflation. Um, it is supposed to achieve price stability. There's an in-between. There are very expansionary monetary policies, if it wants to carry these out, that can affect, in effect, can change nominal GDP by as much as it changes the quantity of money. And yet we have some economists saying that these operations have no effect on the economy at all. I want you to realize just what a mess macroeconomics is in. All right? You know, it's not to you to decide who's right and who's wrong. The, the great exponent of, 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 of the view that QE does nothing is, is a chap called Woodford at the uh, Columbia University in New York who wrote a book in 2003 called Interest and Prices, which effectively dismisses money from the economy altogether. And Bernanke is being much influenced by this tradition. You will gather I'm influenced by older authors who, in my view, are much more right than these people are in the 21st century. What Woodford and Bernanke are doing, of course, is focusing only on the central bank balance sheets, forgetting commercial banks, forgetting the non-bank private sector, forgetting the deposits held by the non-bank private sector, forgetting the quantity of money altogether. Before I move on, let's just say that um, 
QE works, according to Bernanke and Woodford and these other people, only if it reduces uh, bond yields. So monetary policy usually is about setting of the central bank rate, a short-term rate, and also about, with QE operations possible, also to affect longer-term rates. So QE is about raising the prices of bonds and reducing yields. We'll talk about that in a second. This kind of approach isn't unique uh, to Bernanke. Um, there's a, a lady at, uh, on the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England, Professor Tenreiro from Argentina originally, but a professor at London School of Economics. And she said uh, um, earlier on this year that um, the um, a speech in Glasgow that she saw it as her job, to quote, to make clearer the similarities between central bank operations which affect bond yields, QE, uh, and bank rate, so determination of bank rate by operations between the central bank and the banks, uh, and bank rate, and avoid the impression that there is independent money channel of these operations. In other words, monetary policy is simply about the setting of the short-term rate and trying to influence the long-term rate by these operations. Nothing about money, and there is no independent money channel. Now, in Argentina, in the last 40 years, the compound rate of increase in nominal GDP has been 72%. There is no corporate bond market in Argentina. Companies cannot issue bonds in those circumstances because nobody really knows what interest rate really means. And I suggest, with all due respect, Professor Tenreiro, that the dominant reason for the increase, compound annual increase, not only 72%, was that the quantity of money rose, compound annual increase in that 40-year period, of 73%. I'm again, contrary to what Tenreiro has said, there is a massive literature going back to the 16th century, 18th century, David Hume, Richard Cantillon, many, many distinguished figures, including John Maynard Keynes, talking about an independent money channel. All right? Where these people come from in the 21st century, I wonder. I don't know. Now we come on really to, let's get back to Bernanke. Let's get, um, and I want now really to focus on two crucial arguments. Okay, two crucial arguments. I mean, eventually, Bernanke did, in this book, did actually mention money, and, and I'll, I'll just again get, get the quote. Here we are. Um, here it is. QE does not necessarily increase uh, broad measures of money, whose growth depends on several factors. This is page 288, and then there's about a few sentences of and that's it. Uh, look. The question is not whether the quantity of broad money is determined by several factors, which is true. The quantity is, the question is, what is the effect of the operations I went through by themselves on the quantity of money? That's a question. And it's two plus two equals four, Professor Bernanke. It's simple as that. Okay. Uh, economists suddenly call the credit counterparts to money growth. I can show it to you, I can show it to Professor Bernanke, these operations affect the quantity of money. It's as simple as that, it's two plus two equals four. Let me now make my two crucial arguments. Let's suppose that investors are rational and forward-looking. The effect of QE is to boost the economy, which makes it more likely that inflation will rise. I mean, this episode, we had a 25% rise in money in the USA, and inflation went to double digits. And what happened to bond prices? What happened to bond yields? Bond prices fell. Bond yields went up. Can we please think about this subject in a sensible way? All right. I know there's general theory, liquidity of preference theory, of the rate, rate of interest of bond yields. I know that. The idea that QE automatically reduces bond yields is not correct in a world where inflation is affected by the quantity of money. 
Think about QE and bond yields in an Argentine context with a compound rate of inflation of 70, 72, uh, increase in GDP of 72%. In fact, the way that, this is my second argument, the way that money affects the economy isn't just through one set of assets, it's through equities and houses and other kinds of real estate. So when the quantity of money jumps by 10, 11, 12%, as I've just shown it can do, what's, what's affected? The stock market, house prices, and then the effect comes true in the economy. None of this, by the way, is in Bernanke's book. It certainly has been true in the American economy in the last three years. Now, um, the um, numbers here are rather small. Uh, if you're watching this on a mobile or a tablet, it may be difficult to read them. I apologize for that, but um, I will explain to you what's going on. This is a table uh, from the uh, Federal Reserve's uh, funds data. It's R101, in fact, showing the capital gains and losses on the major asset classes in the USA quarter by quarter uh, since the start of 2020. Now, the column on the left-hand side, I've added up equities and houses, basically. There is then a column um, for debt securities, which is bonds. So this gives you, quarter by quarter, 2020 to the end of 2022, numbers for capital gains and losses in risk assets, houses and, and equities, and debt securities, which are a bit safer. And according to uh, Professor Bernanke and Professor Tenreiro, it's those debt securities, those bonds, that really are what we should be concerned about. I submit that this isn't true. I submit that what really matters is the effect of a 25% growth rate of the quantity of money on house prices and the stock market. Because, I mean, I'll just tell you what these figures are. In the first quarter of 2020, the value of the risk assets fell by a bit over $5,000 billion. There was a big fall in the stock market, in other words. The value of debt securities rose a bit, a bit over $100 billion. And then there was the very powerful action by the Federal Reserve, including big asset purchases, including QE, which led to that big jump in the quantity of money. And then we go through the next eight quarters, uh, actually to the first quarter of 2022, and the value of risk assets, houses and equities, rose by $30,000 billion. That was why the American economy had a strong boom in that period in the recovery from COVID. And that was why that boom then led on to the almost double-digit inflation as measured by the Consumer Price Index and so on. Let's then look at this column for debt securities. It's much smaller. In fact, the second half of 2020, the movement in the value of houses and equities was 1,000 times larger than that in bonds. Yeah, investors could smell by in late 2020, early 2021, that inflation was coming back and bond prices went down in 2021, and then collapsed in 2022. QB was continuing until late 2021. In three of the four quarters in 2021, there were capital losses on bonds. All right? So, Professor Bernanke, it is not true that if the central bank buys uh, bonds, that always, it may seem a bit odd, but it's a lot of substitution going to capital markets, the, the bond prices actually go down as a result of these expansionary operations. That completes my presentation. Professor Bernanke has said that um, QE works in practice but doesn't work in theory. Look, the problem here, Professor Bernanke, is you've got the wrong theory. You haven't got money in your analysis of the economy. The blame for this I really blame it on the Samuelson textbook, but, but there's, other, there's other things to say. Um, the important point here is that QE works in theory as well as in practice, and it works through changes in the quantity of money. Thank you.